Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. Age of Empires 1 Definitive Edition came out two weeks ago, and in this video I want to talk about the new features and changes. I know for some people it's a tough sell to convince them to buy a game for a second time, especially as a Microsoft Store and Windows 10 exclusive. So I think it's a fair question to ask how much of an upgrade is it over the original? To start things off, the most obvious update is to the graphics. You don't realize until you go back exactly how basic the original was. In addition to the much nicer models, another aspect of the graphics overhaul is that each unit now has more rotations. Where the old game had 8 orientations for each unit, the definitive edition has 32. Because of that, the units look much smoother as they walk around. Another graphical change is that now the buildings collapse when they're destroyed, as opposed to just instantly becoming rubble. I think all of these are great additions, and altogether I think even the most diehard fan of the original game would admit the graphics are a huge step up. Even the water looks great on a large scale, though on a small scale it looks like somewhere I probably wouldn't want to swim. Another big overhaul was to the game's sound. It's a tough thing to come in and re-record voices and music that people feel so much nostalgia towards. I think people probably remember the songs as way higher quality than they were. Here's an example of a passage from the song Mountain Temple. I don't know about you guys, but I'm surprised when I go back and listen to those original songs. They're nostalgic, but not as high quality as I remember. That being said, you do get used to the new music and sound after just a few games, and it's all very well done. The voice acting for the campaigns is also a nice touch as well, which if you don't remember, used to be silent. Gracia in a maneuver designed to strike quickly at your camp. The next big change you'll notice right away is the updated user interface. There's a lot more information being displayed now than there used to be. You have population right beside your resources, including the number of idle villagers you have, which you can also now jump to by clicking it or by using a hotkey. Your current age is also at the top and will flash if you have the resources and buildings needed to advance and shows your progress to the next age as well. You also have new overlays for economy and military. Another thing I like is that the building's interface has been simplified into one screen, showing you the building options that you have all at once. I think it's a great overhaul, though personally if I'm going to nitpick, I'd prefer to see the large info bar at the bottom change to something less intrusive. The ability to scale the UI is a nice touch, but it unfortunately applies to all of it at once, which means less customization than I'd like. Moving on to the units themselves, you'll notice a big change as well in the villagers. Not only is there the idle villager function now, but they're also smarter and can auto-task after making a resource drop-off building. That really takes some of the tedious micromanagement out of the early game. For me, the original game sometimes felt like a vigorous test of my working memory skills, and it was easy to completely forget a group of lumberjacks for several minutes. Now in addition to making those lumberjacks better, you'll notice that the farmers are also easier to manage. Not only do farms now give you more food than in the original, which of course means less of that awful noise, but they're even walkable now so they can let villagers out, though it does also mean they can't be used as protective buildings. An extra feature is that now you can also reseed a farm just by right clicking it instead of having to place a new one from scratch. Of course, at this point there is still no option for queuing up future farms like in Age of Empires 2, I assume because the developers mistakenly assume that we all love this sound. It's a different game, but I really like the Empires Apart solution to this, which is having a toggle for automatic farm reseeding. Another quality of life improvement I personally like is that the buildings are much easier to place. It used to be that buildings couldn't go anywhere that had an animal or one of your units in the way. That made it much more difficult to place down buildings, especially in replacing storage pits at wood lines. In definitive addition, you can now place buildings down with any units in the way as long as they aren't enemy, and you can also walk over foundations. For anyone who plays Age of Empires 2, you'll already be familiar with this mechanic. And speaking of buildings, they have a lot of new features. 
The first one is Rally Points, so units automatically walk somewhere when they're created, and villagers can be given tasks immediately after receiving their Breath of Life. There's also distributed queuing at multiple buildings, which means if you want, say, 15 composite bowmen from 7 archery ranges, it'll automatically spread the units out as evenly as possible. It might be hard to believe, but the old game did not have that feature. Now one persistent problem with the game that's still an issue is the pathfinding. Groups of units in particular have a difficult time navigating any sort of obstacle, especially at a choke point. Sometimes they'll be able to sort it out, but most of the time it's easier to just make sure you're sending them through individually. I think this is a problem that they would love to fix, but I imagine it's a fairly difficult problem to solve, or they would have done it already. Now thankfully, one thing that does help out here a bit is the new attack move function. That means instead of having all your units converge on a single target and ignoring everything else along the way, they simply try to walk somewhere and attack any units they encounter. It's definitely a very welcome change. Another nice addition is the ability to customize hotkeys. There's not too much to say about this one, it's just a handy feature. Little stuff like that just helps you customize the game a bit better and makes it more comfortable to play. Yet another little quality of life feature is the addition of a tech tree. You can now access that in the lobby or in game. Previously, believe it or not, you needed to look up the civilization bonuses and tech tree outside of the game, like in a manual or on the internet. It's hard to believe how long we went without that. And speaking of the tech tree, it's had quite a few changes itself. I'm not going to cover all of it, but I do want to point out the things that jumped out at me while reading it over. First of all, villager work rates have been adjusted in a few ways. Villagers now gather faster from hunting than foraging, which makes sense since there's always extra inefficiencies in hunting and it's more micro-intensive, so it's nice for a bit of extra payoff. Gold and stone miners were also bumped up by 15%, though coinage was reduced from 25 to 10% in order to offset that. As I pointed out already, the farms also now have more food, which is indirectly a buff to wood collection, since that's what you need to invest when a farm runs out. In terms of other global changes to all civilizations, there's a lot of little tweaks to stats and bonus damage. You can either read them on the screen there or follow the link in the description. The most improved unit seems to be the Cataphract, which got more HP, more armor, and a reduction in their upgrade cost. Catapult Triremes and Juggernauts also got a bit of a boost to their HP, movement rate, and a reduction in their upgrade cost. The Swordsman line also got a buff with extra HP, and the Short Swordsman now being available immediately in Bronze Age. Previously, you had to research it. On the other hand, Mounted Archers like the Chariot Archer now take an extra 4 damage from Slingers, which means they now consistently lose with equal numbers, whereas previously it was an equal fight, maybe slightly in favor of the Chariot Archers. Looking quickly now at specific civilization changes, again, it's too many to cover, but a lot of what look like changes are actually just correcting mistakes in the original tech tree, like Carthaginian heavy transports moving 43% faster than regular ones when the bonus was intended as plus 25%. Another example is the Palmyran villagers working 25% faster, as advertised, whereas before only some tasks were effective. I don't think anyone would have a problem with those sorts of changes. Now that's not to say all of them are like that, and there certainly are new ones that have been introduced. In general, if I were to characterize them, I'd say a lot of the new balance changes were done to make the civilizations more similar. A lot of the strongest bonuses were reduced, like the Hittite catapults having double HP, whereas civilizations with unusual gaps in their tech tree are now getting those filled in. For example, all civilizations now get the wheel and coinage. I don't know enough about the game to critique the balance changes themselves, but as a casual player, I'd say the changes definitely make me more confident going random civilization than I would otherwise be, and I'm glad they didn't feel like the civ bonuses were untouchable. It seems like there was a genuine interest in balancing the civilizations for multiplayer games. And just to talk quickly about the multiplayer experience, I'd say I've been really happy with it overall. It's certainly not as busy as Age of Empires 2 HD, but I haven't had issues finding games and the lobbies usually fill up in under 5 minutes. Now there are a few laggy moments here and there, but I would say it's never persistent lag as long as you're picky about only having green pings before the game. The lobby system itself is pretty simple, but it gets the job done for the most part. I have run into issues, but restarting the game tends to fix those. 
The biggest thing is that for whatever reason, there's no rating system, which is a little surprising to me. It means you have to self-select which games you want to play based on whether you think you're a noob or a good player. It's sometimes hard to self-assess, and everyone has different ideas of what those terms mean. More often than not, I found teams end up being pretty unbalanced. Of course, every game being unrated also takes a lot of the pressure off, which is a nice thing for people who are playing mostly for nostalgic reasons. Now speaking of the absence of a rating system, I know a lot of my viewers are Age of Empires 2 fans, and maybe haven't played or don't remember Age of Empires 1 quite as well. So I want to quickly mention some of the familiar features, like ratings, which are not included in Definitive Edition. It's important to realize a lot of the intention with Definitive Edition was to not change the gameplay too much, so it was a conscious decision to leave a lot of these out in order to preserve the core gameplay. Still, they're worth pointing out so you don't go into the game expecting a reskin of Age of Empires 2, because that is definitely not the case. I've already mentioned the lack of a farming queue, which means you do have to manually rebuild them as opposed to just occasionally filling up your mill again. There are also no formations, which means no fancy split moves with your archers, and units don't really move around in an organized way. You also have no market to rebalance your resources. There is the naval trade system of exchanging resources for gold, but even with that, conserving gold is much more important, I've found, than in Age of Empires 2 team games, and it's possible to completely run out of gold and wood with no practical way to obtain more. There's nothing analogous to trade carts or relics to generate infinite resources. Another one of the biggest differences is the lack of a garrison feature. Villagers aren't very good at combat, and if you are caught off guard by a few Bronze Age units without any defenses of your own, that could easily cost you the game. In contrast with Age of Empires 2, a few knights or crossbows might hurt your economy and set it back, but would never be considered a threat to your town center. Another difference you'll notice is that there's still no scout at the beginning of the game, meaning you better get used to scouting with villagers or playing explored maps. Also, there's still no gates, though to be fair, with the pathfinding, choke points blocked by academy units and towers are arguably more effective than gates would be, and it's not hard to use a house as a makeshift gate or to just delete part of your wall and then rebuild it afterwards. There are also no triggers in the scenario editor, which really limits the complexity of what scenario designers can do. Of course, you're also missing the Steam Workshop with its easy access to scenarios, graphic mods, additional AIs, and all sorts of other amazing things. So I hope that gives you guys an idea of the state of the game at the moment. It's a difficult balance they're trying to walk between appealing to the die-hard Age of One players while also making the game feel less dated and to hook some new players. I think they did a good job in finding that balance. I've read some reviews online that seem to have expected a more modern update that pushes the RTS genre and includes all of Age of Empires 2 features and more. But I think what some people miss is that's the point of the Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition, and ultimately Age of Empires 4 as well. I think it's fair that Age 1 players shouldn't just have their game completely remade into Age of Empires 2. Some people prefer the original game mechanics, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The reason I say the developers hit a good balance though is that I think they've updated it enough to make it a bit more accessible to the wider Age of Empires community. And personally, I've had more fun with it than I ever did with the original. But those are just my thoughts, I'd be interested to see yours as well. Do you have the game, are you thinking about getting it, or if not, what's stopping you from wanting it? Are there reasons beyond just the Windows 10 requirements and Windows Store exclusivity? Let me know. But that's all for this one. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.